Hey, hello everyone and welcome to Design Timber. My name is Bryony Bodymead. I'm the Editorial and Events Coordinator at Timber Development UK and will be your host for today's webinar. This is the eighth session in our third series of Design Timber, where we hear from the multidisciplinary design and delivery teams behind exemplary timber buildings selected from the 2023 Wood Awards shortlist and winners. Today, we will be learning about the headquarters for the National Manufacturing Institute of Scotland, yeah. highly commended within the structural category. But while people are still joining, I'll take a couple of minutes to tell you a few things about Timber Development UK. So, PD UK was formed in 2021 to bring together and support the entire UK timber supply chain. We represent everyone from supplier to specifier, including architects, engineers, contractors, craftspeople, and all points in between. Here you can see TDUK's three key missions. One of the many ways that we seek to deliver on these is with events such as our Design Timber Talks, through which we hope to educate, inform, and inspire designers and other built environment specialists to build better and lower carbon using intelligent timber design. If you go to our website, you will find a wide range of other timber knowledge resources. This includes Designing Timber, our regular print magazine, a library of technical case studies, and our timber knowledge sheets, which cover essential topics such as fire safe design, acoustic regulations, and timber connections. While many of our resources are available to all, there are a lot of great benefits to becoming a member. For those of you who are not already, we would love you to join us. Not only does this benefit you and your business, but it also supports us to continue to put on free educational events like this one today. And now I have the pleasure of introducing our speakers for today's webinar who are going to tell us about the new MS headquarters. We are delighted to have Adam McAvoy, Associate Architect at HLM Architects, Steve Pete, Structural Engineer from Ingenuity, and Alex Brock, Pre-Construction Manager at b &K Structures and b &K Hybrid Solutions. We will hear a presentation from each of our speakers, followed by a short panel discussion where we'll be able to ask audience questions. So during the presentations, please do make use of the Q&A feature that you can find at the bottom of your screens. And I will now hand over to Adam. Stop sharing there. So hopefully everyone can see the screen and you can all hear me okay. So yeah, hi there. I'm um, Adam McAvoy from HLM Architects. Um, so I've been asked to give a little bit of an introduction into the to the NIMIS project, which is short for the National Manufacturing Institute for Scotland. I'll give you a sort of bit of a background on the typology of the building, the work that the building does now it's complete, and an introduction to the to the architectural concept as well as a bit on the on the brief from our client, all of which informed some of the structural solutions that, that we adopted. So the building itself is around twelve thousand square metres in this phase one development. Um, as architects, we worked on the project in 2018 in a feasibility study. Uh, the construction started on site in around November 2020. It was officially opened in, in June 23, so it's been open for, for over a year now, and we're undertaking uh, post-occupancy evaluation with our client, the University of Strathclyde. So the brief from the university was for, for this new building to be the headquarters of the, the National Manufacturing Institute for Scotland. And ultimately what NIMIS is about is, is about driving the future of, of manufacturing in Scotland through innovation. And when we talk about innovation districts, we often talk about a sort of triple helix of industry, academia and public sector all working together with a common goal. And that is ultimately what, what NIMIS embodies in the concept. So a key message from the from the stakeholder workshops was that ultimately this is about helping Scotland become a global leader in manufacturing again. And the building currently works with industry partners from, from large organisations such as whiskey distilleries in Scotland through to looking at how potentially fibreglass windmill blades can be recycled to end of life um, through to working with single person startup companies and help prototype ideas and, and concepts that, that, that people may have to, to get their businesses off the ground. So it cares for a wide variety of different stakeholders. <clears throat> 
the ultimate outcome of all of this is a very ambitious brief. A client said that the ambition is to, to launch more so Scottish satellites into space, for green ships to be built on, on the Clyde, and to grow a circular wind industry that will create homegrown jobs and manufacturing supply chains within Scotland. So it was a very ambitious and innovative brief, and the architecture had to respond and reflect those ambitions. So again, testing ourselves and asking, well, how can how can architecture help facilitate innovation and manufacturing? And the diagram on the left shows this idea that, that two heads are better than one. And I think we all know that very rarely does, does one person's idea result in the best outcome, that actually by working together and collaborating, um, we can reach a better product at the end of it. So that was a key thing through all of our stakeholder engagement, that, that collaboration was key. So the diagram on the right shows that there are three key components, which I'll come on to describe in a little bit more detail. So, but the, the area in the middle, that sort of interstitial space highlighted in blue is what we've called the forum, which glues all three of those quite different functional spaces together and creates the, the, the sort of beating heart of the building um, and encourages collaboration. So the three key components for the project are the digital factory, <clears throat> which is uh, a fully connected digital manufacturing environment. It's clad in quite a bold and distinctive heather colour inspired cladding, which uh, reflects the Scottish landscape. And within the, the, the factory, it's about helping manufacturers embrace future technologies. So there's a number of robots, cobots, and additive manufacturing facilities all within the factory. Um, and, and NIMIS works with companies to, to help them embrace these new technologies and overcome roadblocks and inefficiencies in design and manufacturing to increase productivity, improve sustainability and reduce wastage in, in design. Um, when we when we looked at the brief for the project and as we developed the design, even to when the project was on site, we didn't know what equipment was was, was going to be put in the factory because this, the equipment is constantly changing. So we designed a space that was a, a sort of large 30 metre clear span with a gantry crane that you can see in the image that spans the full length of the factory. Uh, and that is to provide sort of future flexibility. There's a number of service trenches which will allow it to be to be reconfigured in the future as these new technologies and manufacturing systems are are brought in and replaced. There's then the innovation collaboratory, which is is where academics and industry partners come together in a more sort of formal office type environment and and meeting spaces uh, to work on projects and, and to, to promote that collaboration. There are a range of, as I say, different meeting spaces and places. Um, importantly, there are no cellular offices within the building. It was very deliberately designed as an open plan office, again, with, with collaboration in mind. So creating a structure which spans over, over this large open plan office uh, was a key requirement of the brief as well. There's a Manufacturing Skills Academy which is somewhere between the two components that I've mentioned, but it's about transforming the workforce of today and looking forward, um, uh, working with partners such as Skills Development Scotland uh, through promoting apprenticeships, and it has links to the college and university network within, Sc within Scotland, um, as well as places for, for industry partners and stakeholders to host seminars or, or workshops within, within some of these spaces. And, and they are all generally classrooms, lecture theatres, and they all have a strong connectivity to, to the factory floor, which is important um, if you're learning about future of manufacturing, that, that, that sort of tangible manufacturing space is there. And then there's the forum, as we, as we touched on in that early diagram. That's the glue that holds all these different components together, the interstitial space between, between everything where, where collaboration, uh, debate, and sharing of ideas comes together. For those who don't know where the project is, so Nemesis is on the uh, sort of left hand side in that sort of orange dot there, uh, immediately adjacent to Glasgow Airport, which is just on the boundary of, of Renfrew and Paisley, which are two large uh, towns in Scotland. And further to the east on the right hand side of the image is, is Glasgow, the uh, city of Glasgow. And it's connected with, through the M8 motorway, it's about a 20 minute drive uh, to Nemesis. Um, and you can see the Clyde, which runs right through Glasgow all the way down past Renfrew, which is a long history of, of industrial shipbuilding um, and ultimately sort of created a lot of the, of, a lot of the city of Glasgow. 
So there's there's connections to the river as well as to the to the ME and to the airport. So it's quite a well positioned site. So NIMIS is the, the red dot on this plan and is one component of what is a larger ambitious ambitious project called the Advanced Manufacturing Innovation District for Scotland or AMIDS. Um uh, there's a number. There's only two buildings built so far, but there are there are conversations about developing this master plan further. Uh, the other building adjacent is is med is focused on medicines manufacture, um, but Nemes is the main tenant and anchor point as you arrive on the on the AMEDS campus, and a number of the facilities that were were briefed as part of Nemes were to be shared across that wider AMEDS AMEDS campus. So one of those spaces is the forum, as we've discussed. So. It's shown in red in the in the diagram in the top there. It's the main entrance into the building. It has a work cafe which can be shared not only by the users within the building but by that by that wider image uh, district. We then have a very simple diagram linking all the components together. So the sort of green space is is the office innovation collaboratory, and then the the, the sort of paler green larger volume is the digital factory, and the purple is the the Care Manufacturing Skills Academy, which again links links the, the two different components together as well. So looking at the plan in a little bit more detail, uh, we created this quite strong structural grid which faced perpendicular to, to sort of north and south orientation and opened the building up into the main entrance on the sort of bottom right hand side of the page. The areas in red and purple are publicly accessible, so anyone can come in and, and, and use the spaces if they've booked them. Um, other stakeholders can come in and, and discuss ideas, and there are meeting rooms which can, can be used. And there are also the sort of main cafe, lecture theatre and seminar spaces there as well. And what's important is I think through all the full building there's there's connectivity into the factory. So there's there's a number of large grey screens uh, within that sort of red space that you can see linking into the to the factory. The green spaces are are the office environments with a number of meeting space and different welfare facilities and then the factory to the sort of north centre of the plan. At the very top of the plan, you can see there's four plant pods, which are, are bolted onto the rear of the building to the service access. And these are deliberately designed to be reconfigured and, and adapted um, in a sort of plug and play manner as the building is developed going forward. Moving to the first floor, there's a continuation of some of that office floor plate with strong connectivity between the two. So there's a number of vert vertical circulation nodes, existing staircases. Um, um, that, that, that link the two different floor plates together. And on the right hand side, there's a Manufacturing Skills Academy in purple, and you can see how that interlinks with the, with the factory space. On section, we can see the interface between the two different structures for the, for the workshop on the right hand side and the large span steel truss. Um, and on the, on the left hand side, we have the CLT and glue lamp frame with an innovation collaboratory, which spans over the open plan office on the left hand side. And what that creates is quite a distinct uh, form and diagram for a building between these two different structures, uh, and the building ultimately becomes the the, the centerpiece for for the AMED scheme and what is known as Netherton Square, which is this main sort of public area within the AMED master plan. So part of the concept of the building was was transparency and to showcase uh, some of the projects that NIMIS were working on. So we've created what's called the Window to the World, which is a large glazed gable on the factory. Um, and there's a number of other windows and viewpoints into the factory to deliberately sort of showcase uh, the work that, that NIMIS is doing and encourage people to, to interact with the building and to, to come into some of the more public spaces. And it was really important as us as architects to create a sense of place. It was a to a sort of farmland uh, with a derelict farmhouse before, so there was very little in terms of immediate context, and there's that sort of low line sort of airport feel generally. So we wanted to create um, something that's a sort of strong and powerful building that, that created a sense of place and really acted as this anchor point to, to the wider image scheme. So we did that in three or four different ways. So first was the bold purple cladding. Um, which, as I mentioned before, is in response to the Scottish landscape, in particular some of the heather that you'd find on, on the hills of a, of a typical Scottish landscape. And we also work with a local manufacturer to develop some of those the, the, the sort of cladding panels to ensure 
it was maximised efficiency from the from the raw sheet material, and there, there was no wastage. Secondly, we took that simple structural grid um, and diagram that we looked at on plan and twisted it to relate to the orientation and to respond to to climate, and that ran through all of the architectural. Um, components that we designed as well as even now the client's logo uh, so it's been a really sort of powerful design move and on a simple level that means we have roof lights as you can see on that 3d view there concept 3d view which which provides natural light within the, the factory with no glare and on the south face for those sloping roofs uh, an area for pvs optimal pv location uh, to ensure those those are sort of maximum efficiency, and it creates quite an interest. And you can see the Glasgow Airport to the top right hand side of the image there. So it creates quite a striking sort of roof form. It's a bit of a nod to some of the vernacular factory type designs that you would see in Scotland along the Clyde. And thirdly, we explored the use of, of biogenic materials, so mass engineered timber for that innovation collaboratory. Um, and as I said, part of the brief was to have this. Uh, large span uh, over the, the open plan office and the architecture is driven by the structure. I think the, the, the diagrid frame is, is deliberately on show um, and, is, and is striking and I think reflects some of the, the sort of ambitions in terms of NEMIS and its innovative structure, uh, both internally and externally. Um, and I think the feedback has been, as it's been, it's the main area that you come into when you enter the building is the Everyone that walks in, the, the, the timber frame, this diagrid frame has the, the sort of wow factor, as, as people say, that, that it really um, sort of showcases and, and reflects, I think, what the, what the wider ambitions of NIMIS are. And of course, it vastly reduces body carbon, as we'll, we'll come on to discuss. So the fourth element was, was tied to this really uh, ambitious sustainability agenda. So driven by the client, but as a practice, we were also sort of finding our feet on, in terms of how we would respond to, to the climate emergency in 2019. So NIMIS is obviously a leading institute with a high public profile. It needed to be innovative, ambitious, collaborative and bold. Um, and we really need, needed to create a sustainable building with low carbon infrastructure. So the main sustainability achievements of NIMIS are it's the university's first net carbon zero uh, operational building for, for regulated energy, it achieves pretty outstanding at the design stage and we've benchmarked the project against all eight of the, the RIBA sustainable outcomes. So hopefully everyone is aware of the, the, the RIBA sustainable outcomes, but they range from operational and embodied carbon on the left hand side to water cycle, right through to sustainable life cycle cost and communities and social value on the right hand side. And as I said, we've benchmarked against all of these, but I'll go through just a couple in a little bit of detail. So the, this is a slide which shows uh, some of the interventions, the sustainability interventions within NIMIS. As we mentioned, the opportunity to, to maximise the uh, natural light and views within the building and, and ventilation where possible. There's also a number of suds and rain gardens within the, the landscaping strategy and we've installed a 100,000 litre rainwater harvesting tank which provides water for, for toilet flushing um, within the building. From an operational carbon perspective, the building is designed to operate without the use of fossil fuels. Uh, as I said, it achieves net zero for regulated energy. Uh, and as architects, we approach the design from a fabric first perspective to ensure high performing new values and air tightness through careful detailing. So the geometry of the roof um, allowed us to put a 500 kilowatt solar PV array on there, so that's 1600 panels currently. And the building takes its heating and hot water from Scotland's first, fifth generation ambient heat loop district heating network, which takes latent heat from a wastewater treatment plant close by, uh, brings that to the to the whole AMED scheme, uh, and then through water to water uh, heat, heat exchangers, then provides heating and hot water for for the building. So that's resulted in a CO two reduction of the of the building around four hundred thousand kilograms of CO two per annum. The energy use intensity of the building is less than 65 kilowatts per hour per meter squared, which currently meets the RIB25 target. And we're looking to uh, currently out to tender to provide additional PV panels um, through canopies uh, and a ground mounted solar array, which will further reduce that energy use intensity and will meet the RIB2030 target. And lastly, um, on embodied carbon, Again, as a practice, we were, we were sort of 
finding our feet a little bit and testing what methods work better in terms of how to reduce embodied and operational carbon. So we use a number of different tools during the design stage, one being LCA one click, uh, and, and looked at on a sort of optioneering iterative improvement basis to what key components could we change to, to reduce embodied carbon and, and, and reviewing that not only with engineers but with, with our client as well and doing cost benefit analysis. So the, the glue lamb and CLT structure is the largest overall saving. So it Steve and, and, and Alex will come on to talk about it in a bit more detail, but it saves around seven hundred tons of CO two in comparison to the steel equivalent. Another component we looked at was the, the curtain walling system. And you can see on the left-hand side image there, it's, it's what's called a BS1 curtain walling system. So that's no transoms. It's a mullion-only system with silicon joints between the panels. And that's uh, reduced the overall aluminium in, in the curtain walling system by up to 65%. Um, and generally, I think we try to adopt principles of MMC be if possible. So working with the contractor, the, the total pre-manufactured value of the project is around 56%. So really, and, and the timber is a, is a large element of that to maximize off-site construction and reduce wastage. So that's a, a very quick fly through on, on NIMIS general, generally from, from our side. I'll now hand over to Steve from Ingenuity to chat in a little bit more detail. Cool, thank you, Adam. So share. Hopefully you can all see that. So I guess as a initial introduction as to the how where we sit in the project, um, we were brought on as uh, specialist timber structure engineers um, under B and K structures um, to deliver the the member and connection design for the the glue lamb and CLT portion uh, of NMIS. Um, and then it was Waterman's that was looking after the foundations and the interface in steel structural uh, steel structure next to it. And in terms of the in terms of early engagement for the scheme, this is on any project. This is particularly with um, mass timber. This is something we encourage across projects. Um, so avoiding designing in silos, as you can see into the top right there, sort of just focusing on concrete member design, connection design with a different designer for each one at different stages. Um, so on this project, I think I think B and K structures were bought on at, at tender stage four, but for the in terms of the actual involvement and input we were allowed we could put into the timber structure, this was quite early um, in in its sort of development. So it allowed us to create some quite simple um, sketches, which so in terms of the early engagement, this is really all we needed to do is sort of agree a really clear design criteria for the project and some quick sketches to make sure that A, it was the, the structure was was buildable and it was affordable to the client's budget. It met the architectural vision, um, but I guess more importantly for us structure engineers that it actually stood up and stood up well. Um, and alongside that, we developed quite a key connection intent that was um, aimed to develop quite key uh, visual and performance characteristics for the building to make sure that that aligned with the full design team. So from the start of the project, I mean, as, as I've already sort of alluded to, the the um, timber diagrid structure itself, it already came with quite a strong architectural form. So the uh, engineering challenge for us was less about um, how could how could we frame this, you know, this volume, this structure, but how can we best deliver on that architectural vision? And some of the key challenges for us were the uh, aspiration for the slender members, as you can see from a cross section of the of the, one of the beams there, and also just the fact that this was such a large, I think, hundred meter spanning um, roof structure. So how you dealt with the movements of that, both in terms of shrinkage, moisture, and uh, any movement from wind and horizontal loads. Um, I guess this, the successful delivery of this was a joint effort across the sort of client and design team. So as an example of this, the when it first came across our desks, there was already quite a clear, well-developed MEP strategy in terms of fitting whether it be fitting in those MVHR units within the di the diagonal um, apertures formed by the by the diagrid roof, and also any sort of small notches and and um, holes, they were already communicated to us 
quite early on in the design process and that allowed us to um, consider that within the overall member member design and connections so moving on to the specifics of the structure itself so as i said the we've got the uh, glue lam and clt structure itself that interfaces with the steel structure adjacent um, these were conceived to be structurally independent so they sort of act independently of one another uh, and then you've got a simple sort of ground bearing solution for the foundation of the building so starting from roof down we've got a um, simple collection of 19 meter spanning uh, glue lamp beams and these have over 100 sort of uh, secondary members at five meter centers to provide additional support to the thin clt roof slab that spanned over the whole the whole glue lamp frame um the there's there's two ways of so a, a diagrid structure there's there's diagrid in, a, in an architectural form and then a diagrid structure itself is quite difficult to achieve with um timber because it basically involves having quite onerous forces um at every single node and connection point so the framing of this splitting it up into simple big 19 meter spanning members and then simple secondary members in between allowed us to create quite um slim um roof uh sorry glue down beam sizes and it also meant we could use very simple connections across most of the uh structure itself so the external canopy for the roof that followed the same principles and that was propped with some slender steel columns just to really help the um sort of the visual of the a thin edge profile for the for the uh, edge overhang that spanned between four and twelve meters uh, and I guess also I should note the that whole external canopy the use of uh, glue lamb and, and mass timber for that allowed the, allowed any thermal interfaces to be greatly reduced and so we didn't need the requirement for any complex thermal breaks across that internal to external interface and then down to the supporting structure that followed the same principles so we had sort of a, a diagonal um, zigzag for the primary supporting um, columns and then that had additional secondaries in between to match the the visual of the roof and provide additional support and what this also did is allowed us to not only support the loads of the building vertically but also any horizontal wind movement as well was inherently um, catered for within that that profile and then as Adam touched on earlier so we did a separate um, embodied carbon assessment just specific to the glue lamb and CLT structure um, and that was using sort of the standard RICS and iStruct T guidance um, and we incorporated the specific EPD manufacturer information and also every single last bit of steel work that was used in the fabrication process for all of the connections and um, with that it came in at a um, I think it was a yeah a, a so 136 kilograms um, of embodied carbon per meter squared of internal um, area and this was based on the A1 to A5, so cradle to completion, so not including any additional benefit that you would get from sequestration as well. Um, and I guess it's important to recognise that this doesn't include the foundations of the structure, but once you include those just specific to the timber frame, um, it comes in at around a, a mid to low B uh, rating, which is still very good for considering this is just a single storey roof structure. And, and with that, you get quite a, a disproportionate amount of foundation that affects the internal um, area that you wouldn't otherwise get from a two story plus structure because you get a lot more um, internal area and you don't need to provide as much foundation comparatively. And you've also got for this structure, you've got a massive external overhang around the whole building. So all of that material is being added on to the internal area. Um, so you have that to offset as well. So in terms of the stability strategy and some of the key challenges we faced um, when designing this structure. So as I said, it was, it's about 100 meter spanning um, in the long direction. Um, with this, we've only got supports at right at every extreme end of the building. So those um, diagonal columns at each end have to resist the entire facing wind pressure that, that hits that building. Um, this was this was a strategy that was developed quite early on. Um, 
in terms of the connection design ahead of confirming members. And what that meant was we were able to um, deal with these high loads and the and quite onerous connections just in four locations. So that image to the bottom left, that, that column base plate only applies in four areas. And what that then allowed us to do, so the other 50 plus column bases, we um, could develop a much simpler um, strategy in terms of just how that's simply connected to the foundations. Similarly to the movements, as I had discussed before, so how that interfaced with the existing, uh, with the steel frame structure. So we're very clear on the movements there in terms of wind, how the how the structure shrinks and expands as temperatures and moisture changes occur in the timber. Um, and similarly, we developed some just quite key details in very specific areas that could deal with the big forces and then have a much simplified approach elsewhere across the whole roof. And in terms of the connection intent for the main roof itself, so the big um, Kaluland beams, um, we used fabricated sort of bespoke um, dowd and bolted flitch plates. This allowed us to deal with the whole range of geometries and forces across the whole structure um, in, in quite a simple um, kit of parts that we were able to use throughout. And there was a few very unique junctions like a handful, maybe four or five, where we had a quite uh, complex meeting of, you know, five, six, seven members. And that same kit of parts was, you know, you could quite easily deal with that situation um, with those components. But sort of stepping back from that, what's what was important to us for this, especially with such a big structure, is you try and simplify wherever possible. So you sort of, you, you concentrate those bespoke areas to just small, unique places. And then wherever possible, we just developed simple screwed connections. Um, so for example, on the left there, screwed column connections. Um, and also for the, I think the 100 plus five meter secondary members, we developed a simple approach where you just screw a steel plate on a, in the factory or at ground level, level on site. So that could simply just be dropped in place. Um, on site without needing to do a lot of connection work at high level. And that's sort of an overview of the, the approach to the structure. So I'll now, now hand over to Alex to talk through the um, Tim subcontractor side of things. Thank you, Steve. Uh, very much appreciated. Uh, and hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining the uh, session today. Uh, hopefully you can all see my uh, my screen up there. So. Firstly, I wanted to introduce BNK uh, Hybrid Solutions, BNK Structures. Um, we are sort of uniquely kind of two businesses, but one at the same time. Um, we were the specialist timber subcontractor for the delivery of this project with a bit of the steel work package as well. We worked on behalf of Morrison Construction uh, to deliver that, that glue lamp frame effectively. Um, sorry, my uh, I'm just going to reshare my screen. It's just causing a little bit of issue there. There we go. So the first uh, the first part of the, the project I wanted to talk about is uh, is modeling both kind of tender stage and post tender stage um, for a, a project such as this, um, where you can see the complexities of the architectural design, the structural engineering. It's absolutely imperative that we've got the confidence in the commercials, the price, the, the delivery and the buildability as well. So during our kind of initial tender processes, we model all of the projects that come through our, our, our doors to really produce a kind of accurate commercial model. But it, like I said, it helps us forecast that buildability, make sure that we're able to deliver this in the right amount of time for the project. And you can see the complexity when we get to site here, you know, Steve and, and Adam have both touched on the kind of connection design, the geometries that were selected for the delivery of the project, both to tie in with the kind of landscape, but also to give um, a kind of view on the timber. When we get to site, it's, it's another challenge. Um, and you can really see that complexity from the model that's now translated to site there. So the timber itself, uh, we use a supply chain of some of Europe's um, biggest and best engineered timber suppliers. Um, the two selected for the delivery of this project were Stora Enzo and Rubner, based in Austria and Germany and a couple of factories in Scandinavia as well. 
So you can see the quantities on the screen there. Uh, it's not a typo. There was 380 meters cubed of CLT and 380 meters cubed of glue lamp exactly delivered to site for this project on a total of 18 articulated trailers making the journey from mainland Europe. That's covering around 15,600 miles, uh, road miles in total to get to site. The CLT itself was delivered in portion from the Gruvon mill in uh, Sweden and the Ibs mill in Austria with the glue lamp being delivered from the Ober mill in Austria as well. Now, Adam touched on a, a figure towards the end of his slides of, of 700 tonnes worth of reduction uh, versus a structural steelwork alternative. It's a really important figure to show the like-for-like -like structure. But one thing that doesn't take into account is the sequestered carbon as well. And sequestering carbon is a very, very interesting statistic. That's the carbon that's trapped within the timber throughout the lifespan of those elements. It's only released back into the atmosphere when it's either burnt or it decays. And the, the timber that's contained within the kind of timber element of NMIS uh, equates to around 560 tons of trapped carbon. So whilst the building is very good from a, a low carbon perspective and an embodied carbon perspective, it's also become a carbon sink and it will conti continue to keep that carbon trapped until its end of life, which we hope is, uh, isn't for many years. The steelwork package uh, for our ele element of works, which was relatively small in comparison to the overall structure, that was manufactured just 40 miles down the road uh, to the south of the site as well. So a very local supply from the steelwork perspective. And there's one final statistic on this screen here that uh, the timber grow back time for that element was um, two minutes and 46 seconds to grow the timber back, which is an incredibly um, interesting statistic that's taken into account the um, all of the, the timber, all of the trees within the uh, European forests of where it's, um, where it's manufactured. And that's the, uh, the grow back time for the timber. So very, very quick. So touching on the installation strategy, um, like I said at the, the start of my slide deck, it's, it's very, very complex. Diagrids are historically known as, as complex. We have it on the vertical elements as well. So there really was no respite for the, uh, the duration of our works on this structure. So you can see the kind of site setup that we had on site here. Um, I'll touch on the sort of moisture a bit later on in my slide deck, but it's quite open. We've got a, enough space to kind of lay the timber around and, and move it around where we need to, which as Steve mentioned, is really important for kind of fixing those connections together on the floor, meaning that we're the most productive that we can be when we get to site. From the installation perspective, we looked at this as a series of V columns uh, initially. Uh, they were installed first with the associated temporary propping. You can just see some of the cantilage blocks with the temporary props there to keep them uh, stable vertically. We then installed the flanking pieces to provide further stability and to produce the kind of X design, if you will. And then we installed the perimeter glue lamp beams around the head of the V columns with a full fix of that element. So that gave us a stability in the vertical planes. We then moved on to the kind of roof elements where we installed the primary 90 meter long glue lamp spanning beams uh, as the first fix, then fixing the infill pieces to give that stability and to create that diagrid overview finish. The CLT was then applied to, at the end of the project as effectively the final element of timber to go in and it was fully fixed and that was designed to limit prolonged exposure to moisture, which I'll cover in a couple of slides time. In terms of the program, you can see here, there was a between 20 and 22 week leading, depending on um, when you sort of count the first deliveries to site. That concurred of a 20 week design detailing and coordination period where we sort of worked with the team to develop the connection details, develop the design and the manufacturing packs ready for them to be sent over to uh, Austria and Germany and Scandinavia. The steelwork fabrication, again, there was a 12 week leading period there with the CLT and glue lamb taking between 10 and 13 weeks, depending on which factory the timber was coming from. And the installation period for this work was about 15 weeks. Now it's a very, very complex structure and intricate connection design, taking account the kind of offsite elements and being able to apply that on the floor without it being in place meant that our crane could continue working at a rapid rate. It means that we weren't having to hold pieces of timber in place while things were being screwed in or installed. Having it all done on, on the floor just made it really, really easy and really simple. Now, I can't get away from talking about timber without talking about moisture. It's uh, very much one of the sort of major topics when you talk to architects, engineers, insurers um, in today's market. And by nature of the site, by nature of where we were located, it rained a lot. <laughs> it was one of, the, uh, one of the wettest periods of construction that we've certainly seen as a business. And managing that moisture on site became, uh, became a challenge. 
but it's one that was well documented, well operated, and I'm pleased to say it was a very, very good delivery. So there's a couple of considerations in place that we made during the kind of moisture delivery of this scheme. Um, operating a consistent and robust moisture management plan is absolutely fundamental to the delivery of an engineered timber project. That's things as simple as removing water away from the uh, timber elements, documenting and reporting on the moisture content at certain junctures, and making sure the following on trades and the main contractors are educated in the delivery of these engineered timber projects. By having that kind of robust moisture management strategy in place will effectively guarantee a, a good CLT and glue lamp delivery. Now, something that we operated on, uh, on this project and the majority of our projects now is a, a moisture management plan. And this has now become a two-step process in moisture management. We have the kind of off-site element, which is the moisture management plan. And then we have the on-site moisture management strategy. And what we're doing with this moisture management plan is highlighting the key risks on engineered timber projects and providing a matrix of responsibility, which gives a clear defined guidance period of which engineers, which architects, which contractors uh, are gonna be looking after which elements. And we found that this is a really, really important strategy in terms of delivering good, solid moisture management. And it provides an overview of responsibility, which again is really, really key for the delivery of an engineered timber project. Too often lines are blurred and a strategy and a, a matrix like this will give us the opportunity to really reduce that overall risk. So thank you very much for listening. On behalf of myself, Adam and Steve, um, I'll now hand back to Bryony and the TDUK team. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Alex and Steve and um, Adam. They were really great presentations. And yeah, we've got some time now for some questions. Um, which is great. So if you could all unmute yourselves, that would be excellent. And I would like to maybe begin with, um, maybe following with, up with you actually, Alex, something that you have kind of all emphasized is the, the kind of role of collaboration in reaching the best outcome of the project. Um, and, and something that we quite often hear in, in the webinars that we have is the sort of a special need in timber projects for collaboration. And I just wanted to ask your thoughts about whether timber and kind of hybrid timber projects do tend to have kind of more integrated collaborative relationships um, across teams. And I guess beyond the necessity of that, like what other benefits come from that? I think by by nature of the of the materials, um, collaboration is is fundamental on any, on any timber project. Um, we still find it's referred to as a kind of new material, despite building with timber for for thousands of years as uh, as humanity. Um, some of that's down to the questions that were being asked by insurers, building control, fire engineers. Some of that's down to uh, complacency potentially with materials. And some of it's down to the kind of expertise of delivering kind of large scale projects like NMIS. So we're certainly seeing a growing amount of, um, of collaboration. We're being engaged earlier. We're seeing a lot more projects at kind of stage two um, to help you know, deliver a malleable structure and provide structural advice. And it's not just on things like member sizes, it's also on um, on you know fire design, moisture design, uh, insurance queries, etc. Steve, Adam, I'm sure you're probably having the same conversations as well. Yeah, I'd say you know, over the past compared now compared to five ten years ago, there's there's a lot more a lot more queries we get are, are from early stage, um, which is good. Um, and as you say, a, a lot of the time it isn't isn't just so the engineering of the um, structure can be considered. Also, it allows us to highlight risks that an acoustician might be able to, uh, with special um, experience with timber structures, might be able to deal with, um, or a fire engineer, for example. So, yeah, so a lot more of that early engagement is is happening. I think from a perspective as well, I think <clears throat> the detailing was key in this project to make sure that all the interfaces were really carefully considered. So, architecturally, we wanted those to be sort of visually considered through the early design process. So, working with with the specialists to make sure those all those old worked as early as possible was important. So yeah, and that's a, it's a principle we take forward in all the projects now. Mm, great. And Adam, a question about um the the kind of clients' attitudes to, to the timber. 
whether this was, I guess, at, at what stage the decision came for a timber structure and did how did the client feel about that? Were they enthusiastic? Did they need to be reassured? And also you talked about the, uh, the brief and the kind of um, the operational energy being part of the brief. And I was wondering if the embodied carbon is also part of the brief on the client's part. Yeah, um, the first part, yeah, the, the from stage two, ultimately we tested different concepts with the engineer to look at steel versus timber, um, tested different options and did a cost benefit analysis. It wasn't purely on 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 what they felt looked the best or, or, or on body carbon. There was a number of different factors that we had to, to bear in mind. So but the client was ultimately I, I, as keen and as, as 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 ambitious as we were to drive this forward. And I think they felt that the structure ultimately embraced that ethos that Nimis was all about innovation and in construction and manufacturing. So so they were very keen to 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 push forward with the uh, with the timber the, the glue lamb and CLT frame and no there wasn't any sort of stipulations on insurance or fire risks or, 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 or early stage two and and from the full contract there was there were never any issues so that was all managed by the university and in terms of embodied carbon there were no metrics but as I said through sort of iterative improvements and analysis on each of the different building components we were able to to sort of explain to our client and, and ultimately in all honesty work out ourselves as well to, to, to sort of start trying to do these early calculations in 2019, 2020 and understand what that meant, steel versus timber um, and the different glazing systems as well. So it was a sort of open, honest conversations rather than it must be this, it must meet this metric. It was let's look at each one on a component level and understand what impact that had on, on a number of different factors and cost being one. Hopefully that answers yeah. the question, Bryony. Yeah, no, perfectly. And actually on that, there was um, one question that came in from the audience that was sort of in relation to the fabric first approach, um, which was about the kind of how you accommodated for the um, relatively low U value of the fully glazed facade in comparison to a, a solid wall. Yeah, if you look at this sort of, it's, it's a fair question. If you look at the glazing ratio for the full building, it is relatively low. Um, I think with such a deep plan building uh, and the factory being connected to the office, it was important to have natural light and views um, uh, into that sort of deep office space. Um, I think as well, the the issue with, with loads of glazing is, is more to do with solar gain than overheating. There's there's the canopy which extends over and provides some solar shading. Um and then there's an element of specification of the glazing itself to to sort of have a high G value and, and reduce that solar gain um through the design and specification of the glazing itself. And it is a very high spec uh, glazing system. Um and using a single product around that full envelope reduces the number of interfaces um and therefore makes the airtightness of the building uh, easier to, to sort of manage and, and to meet quite an ambitious target of what was three and achieve three during construction at, at the end of the construction phase. But it's a fair question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That, um, Steve, I, I wanted to ask, I know you have lots of experience with um, timber engineering and timber projects, but were there any aspects to the design of this structure that were new to you or any areas that and felt like you particularly learned from in this project. I guess not new as such, but it's not it's not every day we're designing such a massive um, sort of roof structure. So so always when those sort of types of projects come in, um, really appreciating sort of the changing in moisture content of that natural material, how that's going to move relative to the the steel frame building adjacent to it, which is going to move completely differently um, to that and coming up with a way of dealing with that movement in a, in a simple, um, clear way, rather than just trying to deal with any locked in forces that, that might sort of um, come about because of that movement. Um, so yes, yeah, so just trying to develop a clear strategy, be, being clear with the so with the other engineer for the um, steel frame building with um, with HLM, just what those movements are, what we can expect. Um, so things like the architectural detailing can um, consider those as well. 
And there, there was actually a question about um, steps taken to de-risk to de -risk any potential issues with having a green roof on top of the glue lemon CLT. So I, think, I guess that was a question about any uh, sort of design detailing that was used there. So from a, a best practice perspective, um, sort of having uh, weep holes, having moisture membranes, having robust systems, uh, both sort of hardware and software are always recommended for the for the use in sort of green roof, blue roof areas. Um, we do highlight that as a as a risk, um, you know, for retained and, and sustained moisture above the engineered timber. But with the right activities and the right um, kind of protocols in place, that can be managed in a sufficient way. There are no um, roof penetrations uh, with the, the sort of roof weights that are on sort of upstanding curves. The, the, the sort of man shape system on the roof is a sort of ballast shape system. So uh, sort of weight bearing rather than, than fixed penetrations through the membrane. So we'll try to minimize as many sort of roof penetrations as possible. Question about fire safe design, um, whether you could sort of describe some of the key parts of the fire strategy and there was also a particular question about the separations between the different um, parts of the building. Yeah, I did see a couple of questions in the q and so I'll try and answer them all. Um, so yeah, the fire separation uh, in terms of the com compartmentation of the whole building, there's a, there's a two hour wall between the office environment and the factory and that's dealt with by two hour glaze screens. Um, as well as non-fire rated screens and, and fire curtains, which were more economical for the, the smaller areas within the office. Uh, so that's the only sort of com compartment in, in the building, and, and apart from the, the plant rooms, which are obviously their own separate separate compartments. In terms of the, the fire protection, there are CLT floors within the, um, the, the Manufacturing Skills Academy pods within the factory, so they achieve fire rating through the inherent properties of, this, of the CLT structure itself. Um, all the timber has a surface spread of flame treatment applied to it um, to, to meet the building, require, building regulation requirements, but the structure for the roof, because it's not a, a load-bearing floor, uh, doesn't need to, to achieve the same fire requirements. So the large diagrid frame doesn't need to, for example, achieve 60 minutes as would be if it was a, an interstitial floor within a building. Um, but yeah, the surface spread of flame applied to the to the whole timber glue and CLT frame. I think that answers all three of those questions, hopefully. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, yeah, I should, and Alex, a question about, I know you, get, you went into some detail about the um, protection of the timber from moisture. And this, I, I guess, is connected, but um, there's a question about any steps taken to keep the timber clean during construction or whether there's a kind of cleaning process that happens in the finishing stage. Yeah, I mean, with with such a visual material, it's really important to, to keep it as clean as possible during the installation process. So the timber itself is wrapped in the factory when it comes from uh, from mainland Europe. So when it's delivered to site, it's completely sealed. Uh, we take it out of the sealant to make sure that any moisture is not trapped within and we'll store it away from the ground and away from uh, kind of treading feet and muddy boots, uh, which is a really important part of that construction procedure. When it then um, is sort of installed, it, it has a coating of, a, of an aqua varnish product, which is a kind of moisture resistant uh, varnish or a wax effectively that will help keep the moisture out, but it will also help make it an easy clean for any any mud and, and spatter that ends up on the um, on the glue elements. Uh, with it being timber, it's relatively easy to, to work around as well. So if, as an example, there is a kind of, you know, small mark of damage or, or mud, it can quite easily be sanded away um, and, and return to that same finish. Thank you. Um... Okay, um, question about the externally exposed timbers and whether there was any treatment needed on these um, for durability. I believe externally the only exposed timber was the, um, I guess, the underside of the beams to the canopy. Um, so, so there was none that were, that were actually exposed to direct wetting. Um, so there was, yeah, none in that sort of higher risk environment um 
I mean, Adam, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not. No, no, that's correct, Steve. Yeah, I think any... we we clad, and it's really hard to to see and probably the success, the detail, and the, the the actual outside face of the timber that you see on the on the innovation collaboratories and Akoya timber clipboarded cladding. So um, it's not the exposed glue lamp structure, and that's as as Steve said to to avoid the sort of weathering and the uh, the sort of impact it would have on the structural frame. We did look at that during the design uh, stage to have it exposed. I think the impact that would have had in terms of fixing and specification was was too onerous. Yeah, yeah, I think there's yeah, I did, I forgot about the um yeah the visual Akoya piece on on the end because Akoya is very is very durable for exposed conditions for you know a building of this sort of fifty year design life. Um, whereas the glue lamb just being exposed on the underside without direct wetting is fine yeah. for that sort of fifty years. Um, and if it were to be exposed, it is doable. We've done plenty of structures with that, but you do need to be more mindful as to how you connect things. You avoid water traps, um, making sure you've got periodic inspections so you can reapply um, coatings and things like that to protect the timber over time. We've had a, a really nice uh, question, actually, which I'll just read out. So it's a, a, set of, a very sophisticated and elegant timber project. Well done to all involved. And then asks how many of the speakers had any timber education specifically at university, which is something that we yeah we sometimes do ask about because are aware of the kind of limitations often in a focus on timber. So that's nice to have been asked, and yeah, it would be great to hear. Yeah. I guess I'll jump in first from my degree over well over ten years ago now. Um, we had it was very very little. So it wasn't touched on much at all. Um, but I know from um, previous graduates that have come from the university I went to in Sheffield and I know from other other universities, that is something that over the last, you know, particularly five, five years plus has been incorporated into lectures, whether it be just modules within a whole uh, lecture series or um, entire sort of modules that people can can opt in for. Um, and, it, and any design courses, it seems that they're focusing more on um, timber and sustainability side of things, which brings in things like timber and reuse steel and bits like that. So it seems like the education is is evolving with the with the time. Um, for, from my perspective, I, I don't actually hold a, a construction degree. I have a, a degree in motorsports engineering. Um, so uh, very little timber in uh, in F1 cars. Um, but it's a question that we uh, we we ask ourselves uh, on a regular basis, and we do get a lot of questions from from current students um, asking about timber for their kind of final year projects or their their own kind of personal interest. And it's something that, that we've kind of made our mission now is to make sure that we're educating the next generation of, of timber specifiers and timber users. You know, we're, we're all trying to lower the embodied carbon of of the industry, but if we're not teaching the right things for, for the next generation it's going to be very very difficult to do that so um yeah we we work a lot with the, the university of sheffield and a couple of other universities as well to provide that advice with our structural engineers yeah and sort of architectural education a similar sort of time frame to, to speed sort of 13 14 years ago there were there was discussions on embodied carbon very sort of early um timber was was discussed and glue lamb was was a product but i think most of the education has come through being with hlm for for those sort of 13 years post uh, post education and continuous professional development attending seminars like this one today to, to understand both the challenges and the benefits and um, so yeah most of it's it's come through sort of practical experience and 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 learning through cpd as so well i would say but yeah, thanks for the thanks for the comment though. Well, I think we are almost getting to the end of our time. Were there any other questions that you had particularly wanted to answer before we finish up now? There was just one that, that I saw come through to to talk about the um the kind of timber canopy um converting to a steelwork canopy um just to clear that that was a uh, an image from the reverse of the structure so the, the timber canopy remained at the front all the way through it was always part of the design brief uh the steel canopy at the back was was to sort of shadow the um the, the adjoining structure effectively just wanted yeah, to clarify you. that one sure there was, there was also just while we we're on that there was a question of how how we actually dealt with the movement at that 
sort of interface between the glue lamb still um i mean quite simply sort of the tim the timber roof moving in towards the the steel structure because the roof was so deep and stiff the, the movements weren't actually that that um that large for that it was around sort of 20 mil so we dealt with that quite simply with slotted connections in the in the um beam to steel structure so that just allowed for that movement naturally in the structure and then with architectural movement joints for the for the finishes thank you steve and great yeah thank you all i think um definitely keep on going and i know that there'll be more questions to come in so i'm sure we haven't been able to get through all of them but I will just share my screen one more time. And yeah, I would like to say a huge thank you to um, all of our guests for a really great presentation, for generously taking the time to share all of your knowledge with us. And thank you to all of our attendees for joining and participating and bringing your questions. So this has been the uh, Design Timber series for this year. Um, we've learned about some amazing projects across a wide range of topologies and different timber systems. And if you've missed any, they are all going to be available to watch on our YouTube channel. We are wrapping up the series to make way for the next cohort of Wood Awards projects. 2024 shortlist has recently been announced and can be explored on the Wood Awards website and will be exhibited in a public exhibition at the OXO Gallery as part of the Material Matters Design Fair from the 18th to the 21st of December. Now, before we go, um, although I have just said that we're wrapping up the series, we have scheduled a final bonus session, which is going to be a focus on fire safe design. So this will be held on Wednesday, the 10th of October, and will feature leading fire engineers from the fire surgery and IGNIS discussing what the role of a fire engineer is in relation to timber design and fire safety, with a focus on the new nine storey timber office building 36 to 38 Berkeley Square. So please do go to the website to sign up for that and do come and see us at the Wood Awards exhibition. And I'd like to say thank you one more time to Adam, Steve and Alex, and I hope that everyone has a lovely afternoon. No problem. Thanks very much.